this episode of I Forgot to Ask the Doctor, I interview Professor Matthew Phillips around sexually transmitted infections. Matt is a consultant in genitourinary medicine. We discuss symptoms, investigations, treatment, contact tracing, and confidentiality. Please have a listen. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to my podcast. In this episode, I'm going to interview Professor Matthew Phillips about sexually transmitted genital infections or STIs. I worked with Matt as junior doctors a very long time ago. And even back then, I knew that with his intelligence, work ethic, professionalism, and sparkling personality, that the world was his oyster. And I was right. Matt is now a consultant in genital urinary medicine and HIV. His research interests center around HIV, ethics, and the law. Having obtained a master's degree in gender, sexuality, and human rights law early in his medical training. Matt, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed on my podcast. Matt, I find it fascinating to find out why colleagues pick one specialty over another. What drew you to the field of sexual health medicine? Well, thanks very much for having me, Gail. And uh, such a lovely introduction. I certainly uh, remember those days of being junior doctors together fondly. Um, what drew me to GU Medicine was very much the important interaction that you have in the room when you're talking to someone about really intimate parts of their lives. They're sharing things that they can feel great difficulty sharing, having to think about things that they might want to put at the back of their mind. And it's really a, a great privilege to be in that space and to close the door and to know that you can have a private interaction that will hopefully and usually help that person go away feeling better for a variety of reasons. They'll either have some symptoms treated or they'll just have checkups and have screens to see um, that there's no problems there that they haven't noticed. So what I love about GU Medicine is the contact with the people we look after. Um, and it really is a great privilege. That's a wonderful answer, and I can easily see how your personality would fit right in, right in with that answer. Thank you. So, Matt, as you know, this con podcast is aimed at educating patients. So we try to avoid using medical terms so that it is accessible as possible to patients. Let's start with the basics. How many sexually transmitted genital infections are there? So you'd think there'd be an easy answer to that, wouldn't you, Gail? But mm -hmm. actually... I tried to make a bit of a list and then I thought, oh, oh. so the, the ones that we most commonly screen for in the UK, there's a list of four. So chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV and syphilis. But there is a much longer list of um, other common infections, such as herpes that we don't screen for, mycoplasma, trichomonas. Uh, we think of hepatitis uh, A. B and C can all be sexually acquired, but they're not, strictly speaking, sexually transmitted. And we think about HPV a lot, so genital warts and, and that. So I, I'm going to say, I'm not going to give you a number, that's a naughty start, isn't it? But <laughs> the, the common ones, uh, yeah. the, there's four ones that we always screen people for, uh, and you would not... Uh, have a complete screen unless you had all four of those tested for. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. And what are the symptoms of these infections? Do they vary depending on which infection we're talking about? Can you give us an idea, for example, of our patients, when what symptoms should prompt them to go to see someone like yourself or go to be screened um, with a view to being treated? So, uh, they all can show different symptoms. But the, there's some similarities, and it depends on where the infection is sitting. So if we think of, because, of course, we have sex in many different ways, oral sex, anal sex, vaginal sex, so it depends where the infection is. But let's think of, let's think of common situations. Yeah. So uh, genital infections such as chlamydia and gonorrhea in the vagina and the uh, cervix you might not get any symptoms at all, actually, or you might get an increased discharge, or you might have a change in color of your discharge or discomfort during sex, uh, and you may get a little bit of spotting after sex. 
uh, and that those are important symptoms to think about. If you're thinking about for uh, the boys and they and chlamydia and gonorrhea, they get symptoms far more because they're actually weeing through the same place. Ah. So that makes it very uncomfortable for them. So a common symptom for men is a, a new onset of discomfort when they're urinating or penile discharge. So those are common symptoms for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And those symptoms can be uh, more profound if the chlamydia or gonorrhea has gone further up into the reproductive tra tract. So if it's got into the testicles, it can cause a lot of swelling and discomfort um, and for the uh, for a female it can cause a lot of pain during sex and, and discomfort where we'd be thinking whether the infection has caused something that we call pelvic inflammatory disease or PID. So those are the most common um, symptoms of chlamydia and gonorrhea. If you're thinking about herpes which is another common infection, that sudden blistering or sudden um, ulcerations. And the ulceration is kind of like the top bit of the skin has gone off. So that's what we call an ulcer. That are very, very tender. They're worth checking out because that could be herpes. Okay. So um, when people think of infections, they often expect to have a fever or a temperature. Is so uh, the absence of a temperature would that rule out the infection? Should people not worry about it, or is that not? Because no. you've not mentioned it, so um, but people expect that. Well, I've not, I don't have a temperature, so I'm unlikely to have an infection. Is that the case or not? Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, thanks, Gail, and I, I think that helps us to revisit how we think in our specialties um, because you wouldn't normally expect a, a fever with any of those infections you wouldn't normally now it's not impossible if there's a complication such as severe pelvic inflammatory disease yeah but you wouldn't normally get a whole body reaction a systemic reaction so you wouldn't normally have a fever okay so basically any of those symptoms that you've mentioned have a low threshold to go along to be tested and an Definitely. interesting thing you said was that sometimes there are no symptoms so is it possible to have a sexually transmitted infection an sti and be completely unaware of it? Yes, absolutely. It's possible and it's common. Uh, and as we just thought about, it is more common for a woman or yeah. a trans man to have an infection um, because they, because it, it can just sit there comfortably in the vagina or, or the cervix, the neck of the womb, and, and not be doing much at all, not causing any symptoms, really. So, yes, it is um common to have no symptoms. That's very, very interesting. And are there any risk factors? So so I think it's really important to think about, consider and ask about risk, risk factors because sometimes there are risk factors that we can modify in our lifestyle to decrease our risk of contracting whatever illness you're talking about. Are there any risk factors that can that lifestyle modification can help to minimize the risk or prevent the risk of contracting an STI? Yeah, so we used to call it safe sex, but more more modern talk says safer sex because you can never eliminate all risks. So safer sex is so it, it depends on the infections you're thinking about. So let's go for the really common ones of chlamydia and gonorrhea. The wearing yeah. of a well fitted male condom or a female con a male condom more, but a female condom will provide some protection mm -hmm. um, will reduce the risk. Absolutely, but often folks are thinking only of um, intergenital sex, so a vagina and a penis, whereas actually they don't think of using condoms for oral sex, and you can catch chlamydia and gonorrhea in the throat, and you can catch it from someone else's throat via oral sex. Mm. And then, so they don't think of using condoms for their... Um, for anal sex, they do think of using condoms, so that reduces the, the risk too. So condoms reduces the risk of all STIs, really. Uh, so they also protect against uh, HIV, against syphilis, against mycoplasma, against trichomonas. They really are the bee's knees, although yes. many people do not like them. Yeah. 
So if people do not like them, they should think about what consequences are really important for them and think about mitigating it. It's not an infection, but, and I feel a bit cheeky saying this to a gynecologist, but of course pregnancy is a common unwanted side effect from sex. So Indeed. think about adequate contraception. Indeed, very If important. you're at very high risk of getting HIV, you may be able to take pre-exposure prophylaxis medication from your local clinic that will prevent you getting HIV or you may be able to be vaccinated against some infections such as hepatitis A and B. So what I'd really love to get across for any viewers is as much as you can, they never feel embarrassed about telling your doctor what you do and don't want, because the doctor will always say condoms are the bee's knees, but if you think there's no way I'm going to use them, just say that so doctor can offer you the other stuff instead. Right, yeah, that's really valuable advice, really valuable advice, okay. Um, and, and, and actually, while you were talking, I was thinking the opposite is true. So some people may think that other forms of contraception, like the pill, which will reliably protect against pregnancy, assuming, you know, good use, um, as, as indicated, um, they don't protect against sexually transmitted infections, do they? No, unfortunately not. They don't provide any um, level of protection, no. Um, so it really is important for individuals to, to kind of get the information that they want and need and decide what is important for them. So that's that's um, one of the modifiable risk factors. The other is number of partners. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's about rolling dice, really. It's a game of chance. The more partners who you have sexual interactions with, the more chance one may have an infection. So there is... Um, definitely a, a correlation between number of partners and risks. Okay, okay. And so suppose someone thinks that, you know, maybe they have a, a new discharge, uh, they feel a bit under the weather, and they think that, oh, I might have, I might have contracted a, an STI. They go along to the healthcare professional. How, how are they diagnosed? Um, what can they expect? And interestingly, um, many patients, are, you know, I see quite a few patients now who say, oh, yeah, when I ask about, you know, have you had a sexual health screen? They say, yes, I've had one through the post. I've, I've, I've sent it off through the post and I've got my result. Um, so are, are, these, are these tests reliable? What's the gold standard tests? And what are the other options and how reliable are they? That's a long question. Yeah, that's a good long question. Is it nice and meaty? So I... I... <laughs> What, what someone should expect is that the person who they're talking to will not offer them a um, kind of off-the-shelf set of tests. The set of tests should be carefully selected based on symptoms, which is why that trust relationship and that ability to say exactly what's going on, because not all people will get every test done. Okay. So if, if you... Um, were a male coming with new penile discharge, you would uh, and you only had sex with women, so you're heterosexual male, you would absolutely have the core four tests I mentioned before, so chlamydia and gonorrhea after urine, and blood tests for syphilis and HIV. Depending on which setting you go to, so say you come to a specialist sexual health clinic, we'd also take a little sample from the end of the penis, which is minimally uncomfortable everyone's always afraid but it's minimally uncomfortable and we'd look at that immediately under the microscope to see if there was any pus so we could give antibiotics immediately oh, so we wait mm. so it, the, what anyone should expect is a bespoke set of tests based on the symptoms for a female presenting with discharge we would um do those four core tests We'd have a look under the microscope to see if it's just thrush, which is not sexually transmitted, but it is a common cause of discharge. We would look for bacterial vaginosis, again, not sexually transmitted, but a common form of discharge. Um, and we would do a speculum examination, so similar, very similar to when a smear is taken. And what, what would be really important for viewers to know from this is that um, any sexual health clinic wants them to be absolutely as comfortable as they can be because we know it is a difficult situation. So some people 
may feel uncomfortable seeing someone who is not of the same gender as them. They just need to say. It's never taken as an offence. There's no need to worry. Just say, actually, I'm only comfortable with someone of the same gender as me. Yeah, grand. We'll sort it. You might have to wait because if there's only one man in clinic and you want to see a man, then that might take, you might have to wait a little bit longer, but you've seen. Then in terms of tests, so for you can do tests through the post. Um, and some of them are really excellent, uh, usually via NHS providers to see if your local NHS services will do those tests. The pitfalls of using postal tests are that some very new technology can come out that might not be very useful. So, for instance, there is a genital um, bug called urea plasma urea lyticum that we would not normally do testing for in, in the UK um, at all because it's not absolutely clear it's useful to test for it it's not absolutely clear that the treatment is used for so it wouldn't normally be done but the test does exist so you might pass with a lot of money to have this test done and think that it's very useful to you it might not be and similarly, some providers will test urine for herpes. Um, that's not a particularly useful test. It won't tell you much. So you can test it, but it won't tell you if that spot on your vulva mm -hmm. is herpes or not. So it's not always useful. Uh, so I... I don't wish to be discouraging. People should do whatever feels comfortable for them, but it might not meet their needs. They are always better talking to a sexual health provider first to see if the test will meet their needs. Okay. So so, so just to recap, um, you explained about when a male goes into the sexual health clinic, what's done, and a female. So you mentioned um, with males, you take a urine sample to send that off. Females, do they always get speculums? Do they get swabbed with the speculums? Or do they get urine sometimes? And what's the difference? Yeah, thanks very much. So the, uh, a female, presuming she's heterosexual female with no additional risk factors, so you've got those four core tests. That's um, HIV and syphilis from the blood yeah. and a swab from the vagina for chlamydia right. and gonorrhea, which if she has no symptoms, she can do herself doesn't even need someone to examine her. So she can just do it herself if she has no symptoms because no one, don't, she wouldn't need an expert to cast an eye. Yeah. So she can just do it. Got Unfortunately, it. urine tests are not as reliable in females. And again, that's because the two parts are separate. Just yes. really straightforward stuff. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, they're not useful. They can be used, and we would use them in very, very specific situations. So if it was a very young person, who, you know, or yeah. very specific situations. But we don't tend to test for chlamydia and gonorrhea of a woman's urine because it just might not show. That is really, really useful information because I'm not sure that that is general knowledge that swabs. I think people think that they're equivalent. So that is really, really valuable information. Thank you, thank you for that and thank you for clarifying. Tell, talk to us a little bit about contact tracing. What, what, what was that about? <laughs> Tell us a little bit. Yes, what so. is it and what's the importance of it and is it still done? Yeah, thanks very much. And I think we've all got a bit used to it with COVID, whether, whether it always works True. or not on those apps. So contact tracing has been around a, a very long time. And that works on the principle that, uh, say, if I had a test today and I had gonorrhea, then I've got that from somewhere. How do we tell my sexual partner or partners that I've got gonorrhea? And that's contact tracing. So I'll, often, and I've seen this change over my career, actually, with people using lots of dating apps and things, that people will might not even know the name of their partner but they'll know how to track them down it can be right. you know sugar baby 25 on, on this app so they they <laughs> would say oh can you tell sugar baby 25 that <laughs> you've got chlamydia and then the person would say either yes I, i'm comfortable doing it or no 
Yeah. Um, but it is helpful for the other person to be tested and treated, so it's a good thing. What viewers m might not know is that um, we can do that anonymously on their behalf. So say they have the text number of that person, but they just don't want to tell them. Yeah. We can send an anonymous text from clinic just saying, oh, you've had uh, someone you've had sex with has uh, an infection. Please go and get tested. So That's we would always take utmost care in agreeing what information is acceptable to be shared. And we take a lot of care over that, um, a, a lot of care, which is appropriate. So yes, we do partner notification uh, and contact tracing, uh, and it is helpful, actually, really helpful. Perfect, great. So we've discussed um, what symptoms to look out for. We've discussed how people can try to minimize their risk or prevent. We have discussed what investigations will be performed and what patients can expect when they go along and where they should go. Um, the last thing to discuss, I guess, is the last big thing is treatments. What treatments are available and how effective are they? So, and I think we I'd focus on, on the common ones that worry folks, so chlamydia and gonorrhea. So yeah. they're both, both infections, the same as a chest infection or something, so just antibiotics, nice and straightforward. So for chlamydia, we tend to use an antibiotic called doxycycline. So you take that for a week. It, it's, we have to assess if someone's at risk of pregnancy because then we can't use the doxycycline. Mm -hmm. And the person should also, if they take the doxycycline, they should be careful about uh, not getting too much sunshine because they can burn. Um, so it's a well-tolerated treatment. You know, it's a bit of a pain having to take it for a week and you, you can't have sex during that week, not even with a condom, so no sexual contact at all. But that will clear chlamydia. Chlamydia treatment failures are so very, very rare, they make their way into journals. So yeah. you don't have to, you take your antibiotics it will, and you stick to the rules and you don't have any sex, it'll go. That's great. So it, it's really, really straightforward for um, chlamydia. If you can't take doxycycline for lots of reasons, um, then we'd use an uh, antibiotic called azithromycin that we used to use just one big dose, but we give it over three days. And again, that will clear up the chlamydia, no trouble. Gonorrhea is a bit trickier, um, and viewers might have seen that there's all strains of super gonorrhea worldwide, etc. And the antibiotics change every couple of years to make sure that we stay ahead and we don't get super resistant gonorrhea becoming common. So my answer today will be different to the one two years ago and will be different from the one in a couple of years time. But at the moment, if we if someone has got gonorrhea, we give them an injection into their buttock um, of uh, antibiotic called keftriaxone and it's just once and that will clear oh, wow, the okay. gonorrhea almost certainly, but not definitely. And that's why if we think someone's got gonorrhea, we do a couple of extra tests at the beginning to grow it in the lab and check that it's the right antibiotic. Okay. So, so yeah, really effective um, treatments for chlamydia and gonorrhea, even with um, super gonorrhea on the, on the rise. Okay. And so, so that's really, really um, reassuring that we've got really effective treatments. Does that mean, therefore, that if I think I have a bit of a discharge and um, it's unusual for me, um, maybe a bit of burning when I wee, whatever, um, if I have those symptoms, then I can say, well, this is easily treated. I'll go along next week in two weeks when I have time, you know, to see the, you know, get tested, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is, um, is the time to diagnosis important? Because treatment seems very straightforward. Does it matter how long it takes for you to get that treatment? Does that have any importance? Yes, that's a bit of a tricky answer because, you know, that's a common scenario, isn't it? We've all got busy lives. Shall I bother to get it treated now? I guess whilst yet the, the first caution on that, and I'm going to sound like a very cautious Billy for a minute now, but the first caution on that is just because you have those symptoms 
you may not know which infection it is. So you might think, oh, it could just be chlamydia or gonorrhea, but it could yeah. be something else. True. So, so d don't wait because you need to find out what it is. Um, time for it to be there. The studies aren't absolutely helpful in in showing that that is very important. So people often think, gosh, I've had chlamydia for so long, so it must have done more damage. Well, logic would tell us maybe it did, but the studies haven't shown that definitely. So it's not duration. The thing I th thought you were going to ask me there, actually, Gail, and I wouldn't mind answering, is sometimes folks are tempted to just acquire the antibiotic they think they need off the internet. They'll do oh. like an online thing. Um, not useful. Yeah, it's yeah. I, I'd, say, I'd say don't do that. Don't I can do that. completely get the temptation. If you've been told to go away today, because if you contact a clinic and you're going to have to wait a day and you're uncomfortable and you could just send an email and buy some pills that will come tomorrow anyway yeah but you don't have the right diagnosis and it might not be the right antibiotic for you yeah absolutely yeah that's very okay, yeah. okay perfect. <laughs> and are there any long-term problems which may result from sexually transmitted infections yeah so so we we're just thinking about the kind of um standard common infections, so chlamydia and gonorrhea, they can both have um, complications and mm -hmm. they can both um, cause long-term complications, especially when, and this is more for women and trans men, so people with uh, womb uh, fallopian tubes. Yeah. Uh, and what can happen is the infection can go further up, so not just at the neck of the womb, and then it can cause inflammation in the tubes. Now, like any organ in our body, we, we're designed to take inflammation once or twice in our lifetime. So people should not feel panicked or distressed about that. But rec that recurrently leaves scarring, scarring, scarring. So yes, they can have long-term uh, effects. And again, it depends where they are. So again, we're thinking about genitals. In the throat, it doesn't really cause any long-term effects in anyone. But in the rectum, it can cause um, ongoing inflammation, some bleeding when you open your bowels. So yeah, they can all have complications. So it's worth getting screened and tested regularly. Okay. And certainly, um, we see patients in gynecology um, who may have complications um, such as fertility issues, ectopic pregnancies, etc. So the complications can be quite significant. Um, so that's why it's worth getting the diagnosis right, seeing the right healthcare professional and getting the appropriate treatment. Would you agree with that statement? Absolutely. That's spot on. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So we've been talking a lot around um, going along and your your initial statements about why you chose the specialty were, were really um, powerful and moving. Um, and not least because there certainly used to be a certain stigma around STIs. And I'm not sure if this is still the case, um, but certainly in my experience with patients receiving a diagnosis or even getting tested for STIs can cause significant distress. Can you talk about a little bit about that, what your experience is in that regard? And do you have any advice for patients? Yeah, I guess I do. So I, I, it, it's awful to bear witness to the stigma and, and what that causes and the, the anxiety that causes in people. And, and the stigma about not just the infections, but the um, the interactions that may have caused yeah. the infection. So, oh gosh, this person is a so-and-so kind of person because of so-and-so. It's, it's really awful to see, and it hasn't got much place here in uh, 2022. Agreed. But it does exist. And I guess what is important is um, 
one of the special things that we do in sexual health clinics as opposed to any other kinds of clinics is you don't have to give your real name you don't have to give your real date of birth and you we do not routinely share records with any other doctors including gps so oh. that is useful for people to know if that stigma is affecting how they feel um about what's going on it's like you can come don't have to use your name don't have to use your date of birth and we don't write to your doctor okay so it really is a very private consultation having said that um in sexual health clinics i i'm not alone we, we're really against that stigma uh, the, there's a strong belief and a belief i shared that people should lead um the sexual lives that they would like to uh, you know as, as long as it's doing no harm to others, then they should lead the sexual lives that they want. And this is only another set of infections. We would mm -hmm. never be embarrassed about having a chest infection because we've sat on a bus full of people coughing because we got exactly. to sit on a bus. Well, for adults, part of their development and joy for the, a great number of adults is to enjoy sexual lives. So. Mm -hmm. that, don't be worried about talking to us, I'd, I'd say. Um, but stigma is really uh, very rife. It's mm -hmm. difficult to challenge. So, so I think that's that's really, really valuable information. And um, and actually, I wasn't aware of that, that you didn't need to give your name, date of birth, correct, you know, correct name or date of birth. I knew the records are kept separate, and, and that's the reason for that. And communication with the GP, that's always... Um, with patient consent anyway. Um, but I think that's fantastic because I think that will remove a big barrier for a lot of people to go along and, and be tested if they've got symptoms. So thanks for sharing that valuable piece of information with us. Okay, so thank you for answering the question so clearly. Um, as you know, I ask listeners beforehand if there's anything, any questions they'd like to submit for me to ask on their behalf. Are you happy for me to ask you a couple of questions from some listeners that they've submitted? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I must stress at this point that it is def very difficult to give specific and personal personalized advice to patients without a thorough knowledge of their past and current medical history, examination findings, etc. Also, due to time constraints, I've summarized the questions in a way that I think retain the essence of what is being asked. Therefore, these answers should only be used as a guide and individualized care and medical management should be sought from one's own doctor. Okay, so our first question is about mycogens. And our listener asks, about this parasitic-like bug, should treatment be in a slow and steady manner? I've read people having symptom relief and negative tests after taking multiple weeks or even a month plus of doxycycline. I ask mainly because some people think it's incurable due to lacking a cell wall and being able to hide for some time. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. So the, the one we're mostly interested in sexual health is mycoplasma genitalium, which many um, viewers will not have heard of. We've known about it for a while, but there weren't good enough tests until a few years back. So we don't screen for that. You'd never say, I just want you to check me for it. So you'd only ever do a test for mycoplasma genitalium, so based on someone having symptoms. The treatment is tricky for this. So I, I, I'm not surprised the viewer has wanted to know the answer to this. There's a lot of baseline resistance. So doxycycline, uh, plus azithromycin is a course of treatment you can take for this as long as uh, it's not a resistant form of mycoplasma in which case you might need a different form of treatment which may take the form of uh, moxifloxacin or you would just or, or pristinomycin in very rare cases so these are all antibiotics that are not common knowledge amongst doctors it's just really specialized bit of sexual health very specific and very specialized so uh, should the treatment be slow and steady um no why i guess 
no, let's just treat it. It's a bug. Let's get it out of you. If we find it, let's get it out of you if you want. Um, so, but the, the patient does need, unfortunately, to have a bit of patience around it because there's all the resistance testing to go through and it might come back that the treatment needs to be changed. So I can see why it would be frustrating for someone with it. So you said that um, chlamydia, the treatment is a week. Um, does that mean that this treatment is more prolonged? Is it a, a prolonged course? I think maybe that's what they're asking, whether you, you take it for a really long time, is it more likely? Because I guess there's, there's no point in treating chlamydia with doxycycline for a month because you've cured it in a week. But in this infection, um, is there any benefit to a longer course of treatment? Do we know? Or maybe the answer, maybe the answers aren't that clear at the moment. Yeah, so it, it's worth absolutely nailing it down with your doctor. So it might be that if you have got mycoplasma and you are allergic to azithromycin, therefore you'll be allergic to pristinomycin, so you can't take that. Moxifloxacin is a good drug, but it has many side effects. We try not to use that. Okay. So if you were seeming and said you were allergic to all of those things and you couldn't take the other things, you've got no option but to use doxycycline a bit longer for yeah. you than we would in other cases. Yeah. So very much care should always be tailored to the individual's exact circumstances. So some folks would be advised to take a longer course if the other options are off the table. Thank you, that's really useful. So our second question, um, or actually this uh, listener's asked two questions. She says that I'm 22 and single. I've had chlamydia twice and I'm worried about getting it again because I want to have children when I'm older. I'm using condoms and I have a coil. Is there anything else I can do is question number one. And question number two is, how often should I be tested? Okay. Um, so I'm going to venture and give some advice about fertility, which feels very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the viewer who's uh, written in, it has accurately identified the fact that it's more how many times you get chlamydia than how long you have it. Right. So that's the scarring we mentioned earlier, yeah. repeated scarring. Yeah. And certainly there is a threshold in the literature of three times or more than we, we're thinking it's likely to cause scarring. That, however, does not mean it won't be fertile. Fertility is not like a light switch. It's not on and off. It's a scale up and a scale down. And even if there is a little bit of scarring in a tube, the other tube's still working and the sexual partner might be super fertile. So it might all still be all right. So it's it's wise to have an eye open to this, but it will be too much to be lay awake worried about it. Okay. So so basically, yeah, yeah, she's doing, she, she's doing yeah. all that she can do. So condoms uh, is the saying all the time, every time, um, I guess, would be the advice for her until she wants to actually try to conceive. Um, and I guess the other thing that you said is number of sexual partners, I guess. That's the other modification that you mentioned before that she might have a think about. But those are basically yeah, yeah. the only two things. Yeah, but uh, there's no hard and fast rule around that. So if there's yeah. very consistent and excellent condom use all the way through, then exactly. we that's the number one. Minimised. Um, okay. Then the question is how often to get tested. So that yes. is the the advice would be based on uh, a sexual lifestyle. So um, I think the viewer was 22, you mentioned. Yeah. So after... And every new partner change, it's worth getting tested. Okay. Um, but if you turn, if you've got a very high um, number of partners, then you might wish to to program it in. So if you're if you're having a new partner every weekend, yeah, you're in a, a kind of party time in your life, having a new partner every weekend. 
it's going to be worth um, getting checked at least three monthly, if not more frequently. But again, the advice should be tailored to the person. So speak to someone uh, and discuss your actual number of partner turnover. Okay. And do we know that, brought a question to mind, do we know how long before having a new partner it takes to be able to diagnose the infection? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yeah. So two weeks after, and that's really valuable for people to know. Brilliant. Thank you. Two very weeks much. Over for, for, yeah, for chlamydia and gonorrhea, two weeks. Although you may get symptoms before then. So if you get symptoms before then, what, what the, yeah, come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and our third and final question from listeners. Is there any evidence base for treatments or interventions that can clear ongoing HPV infection, which you mentioned briefly before, um, the cause of genital warts and cervical abnormalities, and prevent recurrence? Aside from LETS procedures, so LETS procedures are procedures that gynecologists do on the neck of the womb for abnormal cells caused by HPV. I've been told that once an individual has HPV, the vaccine is not useful. So any evidence base for treatments or interventions that can clear ongoing HPV infection? Yeah, so I think there's kind of two parts uh, to the answer. So Often, and healthcare professionals do this a lot too, actually, they talk about HPV, which is the virus, as if it is the same thing as the manifestation of that virus. So you can just have HPV, and many of us do just have HPV, that's doing nothing, it, it's quite inert, not doing much. So, so let's is for one of the consequences of HPV, it doesn't clear the HPV, it clears the cells that have been affected by HPV, if I've got that right. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Have I remembered my gynecology well? <laughs> I taught you well, so, perfect. <laughs> so so there's, that, there's that bit. So the in terms of how to clear HPV, studies do show that if you don't have sex for a, a long time, and that's years, you, you may clear your HPV. But in reality, this is like, I always talk about it being like having a cold in the winter. You're not sure if you've had one cold all winter, or in fact, you've had 15 colds, got rid of it and got one off the other person with the mm. cold who you travelled on the bus with. Mm. That's how it is a bit with HPV in our sexual lives. We may clear it, but we'll have sex with some more people, and then it will return. Again. Or we'll have sex with the same partner who didn't clear it. We've got one lifetime partner, and they didn't clear it, so... We get it back um, but that is dis it, it is disappointing and it's a very frustrating infection because we can't say oh it's definitely gone we can say the consequences are definitely gone we've removed all the cells we've taken the warts off but we can't say the infection's definitely gone so the evidence doesn't suggest there is a doesn't show a good treatment to clear the HPV infection itself. Um, it's quite right to draw attention to the fact about vaccine and there is interest. So if you Google it, there'll be small papers in very small numbers of people. So observational studies of 20 people with very severe warts who've been given the vaccine and some may clear their warts for the first time. Um, but that is not in medical practice because it's not widespread. Although based on very particular circumstances, a doctor might discuss that with someone about whether it is worth giving. It is far better, as we all know, where possible and where you're eligible to have the vaccine before. And that's why young people have vaccines in school now. There is a vaccination program for men who have sex with men. So if any of the listeners are men who have sex with men, they're all eligible up till the age of 45 to get vaccinated against HPV and sexual health clinics. Perfect. And the new vaccine uh, is for nine different strains as opposed to just four. So. Marvellous. Great. Okay. So finally, 
from me, Matt. One more question from me. You've seen and managed many, many patients with STIs in your career thus far. Given the opportunity, is there anything you'd like to say to patients who think that they might have a sexually transmitted infection or perhaps they've been diagnosed with one? Yeah, I, I have. And I guess reflecting it back to right at the beginning, it is one of the really great moments in a consultation is when you see someone has said what's been worrying them and they can see that you really don't mind and you've heard it all before yeah. and you can just feel the tension exit the room. So what I'd say to anyone who's not been to a, a clinic, then, then go and experience it. It's not because you, you might be sat there and you're affected by all the stigmas, the stigmas that are about um, how, to, how you should conduct sexual relationships and then getting an infection, what that means for you. So that's all, in, that's all going around in your head while you sat at home worrying. Come, come and share your worries. You will be pleasantly surprised because we will look after you really well. And I, it's worth mentioning, sometimes I have seen this as a barrier, all treatments in sexual health clinics is free. You don't pay for prescriptions ever. So, so if you were thinking like, gosh, I couldn't afford a prescription because we are in very hard times at the moment. That's true. There's yeah. nothing to worry about. The prescriptions are free. Talk to the person, go and meet a healthcare professional. If you don't quite gel with them, ask to see another one. No one ever gets offended because you're talking about something very personal. Uh, so, we're waiting to welcome you. That's what I'd say. Don't sit there worried. We can sort you out. Thank you. And and I think, you know, this has underscored why doing something like this to me is so powerful and so valuable to patients. Because you've said some things, you know, I've been, in, I've been a doctor for many years, as you know, but you've said, I've learned from you today so many things. I'm a gynecologist, so you know, we're, we're in kind of the same region, if you like, of the body. Um, but you've said so many things that, 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 that I've learned today. And I think that this would really, really go a long way to removing the barriers to help people to feel safe, comfortable, understood. You know, and for example, I'm a gynecologist, so I know that all contraceptives are free. You don't have to pay for contraceptives. But I did not know what you just said, that sexual health treatments are free. That is that is really, really useful information. And the other, of course, thing I mentioned, you know, you mentioned before was, was that, you know, the visit is anonymous. No one needs to know about it. You don't even to, need to know the person's actual name or date of birth. And I think this will really, really help people to um, to encourage them to come along because it's so important for individuals and for our population as a whole, I think. Okay, so in closing, I would like to convey my gratitude, Matt, for allowing me to interview you today on the podcast and for supporting my podcast. Thank you as well on behalf of you know, our population for your tireless work on sexual health and HIV. And I think it is really, really clear to anyone who looks at or listens to this podcast that your patients are so very lucky to have you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Please keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons to raise awareness of this podcast.